If you're looking for the tips and tricks that help me score 870 out of 900 on the quantitative reasoning subtest on the UCAT, this is the video for you. Hi everyone and welcome back to the YouTube channel. If you don't know me, my name is Emil and I'm a first year medical student currently studying at Monash University and last year I graduated from Scotch College with an ATR of 99.8 and 99th percentile UCAT. In this video I'm going to be talking about my general guide to the quantitative reasoning subtest on the UCAT, which is one that I know a lot of people find really difficult. So I hope I can help you guys. I don't wanna blab on about myself too much, so I'll get straight into this video, which will be divided into three main parts. The first part will be me giving a general overview of the quantitative reasoning subtest. And then the second part will be me giving my general tips and strategies for the subtest so that you can answer this question as well. And then thirdly, I'll show myself answering some questions from the UCAT Consortium's official website from their quantitative reasoning question banks. I'll leave the timestamps in the video description so that you can skip to whatever part you want to listen to first. If you do have any questions about the UCAT, Year 12, VC, or anything else, please do feel free to ask me in the comments or send me a DM on Instagram. I'll be sure to reply and I hope I can help you guys out. If you find these videos helpful also, please do leave a like or subscribe to the channel because it really helps the channel grow and helps me to keep pumping out these videos. Hopefully you guys aren't bored out of your mind already, but let's get into the first part of this video, which will be an overview of the quantitative reasoning subtest. Essentially, as you may know, the quantitative reasoning subtest is just a subtest about maths. It's all about using your calculations, using your mathematical brain to look at data, look at graphs, and to finally get an answer to a question that they might ask you. At the end of the day, there are 36 questions you have to answer and you have 24 minutes to answer them in total, which gives you approximately 36 seconds per question. This means that the quantitative reasoning section on the UCAT is actually a very time pressured one and one that many people find very difficult to do under time pressure. One of the greatest challenges of this subtest in general is to stop yourself from making careless mistakes and mathematical errors when you have such a short amount of time to be answering every question. Now something that saves the quantitative reasoning subtest from being too hard is that questions can come in sets of four and what this means is that Often the mathematical reasoning you use for the first problem in a set of four will be the same reasoning you use for two, three, and four of that set. Now what this means is that you can actually save a lot of time doing these sets compared to the other standalone questions you can still get in quantitative reasoning. With all that general overview stuff out of the way, let's get into my general tips for the quantitative reasoning subtest. Now the first main tip I have for you guys is that you should be very quick at discerning what questions will be easy to tackle under time conditions and what questions will be more difficult and time consuming. Now what I actually mean by this is that you never want to be doing a quantitative reasoning test sequentially like you would do a maths test at school. Now what that means is that you don't want to be doing question one, then question two, then question three, then question four. What you actually want to be doing is like question one, six, seven, ten, fifteen, and then skipping questions as you get through the test. What this means is that when you're doing the quantitative reasoning subtest, you want to be going over in passes. In the first pass, you might answer 50% of the questions. In the second pass, you might answer another 30. And then in the final pass, you might not have enough time so you'll guess the last 20%. What this means is that you prioritize the marks that will be easier for you to get. And this is what I mean when I say that you need to be good at discerning what problems will be easy for you to tackle. This is a tip I give a lot in general for the UCAT, which is that you need to be skipping problems that you can't do very quickly. And this is all the most important in the quantitative reasoning subtest when you have such a low amount of time per question, especially when the questions can be very difficult. Now, in terms of training and practice, what this means is that you need to be very good at keeping an eye out and being cognizant of what you are actually good at and doing in the quantitative reasoning subtest. If you find yourself skipping a lot of the speed distance time questions, for example, you might know that on test day, you'd want to skip those questions and do the other data ones instead. Overall, this gives you a lot more confidence going into test day for the quantitative reasoning subtest because it means that you'll be able to answer 70% of the test a lot quicker than 36 seconds. And it also means that for the last 30%, you'll have more time to do the questions that you find harder in general. Now, the second tip I have for you all is that you need to be familiar with using the on-screen calculator provided in the UCAT 
and therefore also using a physical number pad to type in numbers into there. Something that makes the quantitative reasoning subtest a lot more difficult in the UCAT is that the calculator provided to you by the UCAT consortium on their computers is completely trash. Some of you guys who might have done tests already might be familiar with this on-screen calculator, but it is very rudimentary and very basic in its functions, meaning that you can't really do very difficult problems that might ask you to do simple things like averages. The calculator can really struggle to do these problems and therefore you need to get used to using this calculator because it's the one you'll get on the test and it's the one you'll have to do problems with. Getting used to using a better calculator will actually be like shooting yourself in the foot for test day because you will have to go to a peer review testing site and you will have to use their computers and their calculator. I'll go into the way I use the on-screen calculator a bit more when I answer questions. So if you'd like to skip to there, please use the timestamps in the description below. But otherwise, I do recommend getting used to using that on-screen calculator whenever you do mathematical practice, especially in quantitative reasoning, and also getting used to using the number pad to type in numbers there quickly and with a high degree of accuracy. In terms of using the number pad, you should actually get very, very used to writing with very high accuracy and with as little mistakes as possible. Make sure you focus on accuracy rather than speed on the number pad because of the limitations of the calculator. Because what happens is, is that if you type in a wrong number on the number pad into that calculator, you'll often have to restart your whole calculation again sometimes from step one. Because of the limitation of the calculator software, that's why you need to get used to using it. Now, the third tip I have for you guys is that you need to be using your noteboard to write down the important numbers you come up in calculation so that you don't have to keep it in your head. Now, this tip is something that people don't actually do that much instinctively, but doing it can greatly increase your speed. This is especially important when there are questions that can come as sets of four. For example, you might get a question type which has a set of data and you might be asked to add each column of the data row. Now, most people will actually just add this and try to keep it in the head and use it for the first question. But then what will happen is that in the second question, you'll actually be asked to use that added number again. Now, writing down this number on the noteboard in your calculation will actually help you a lot because you won't need to add up all the numbers again and you won't need to strain your memory which we might forget or make a mistake. As a result, writing down the important numbers you get in calculations on your noteboard will 100% help you so much in saving time because often it will take you maybe two seconds to write down that number, but it can save you about 15 to 20 seconds in calculations if you were to have to calculate that number again. Now, the fourth tip I have is that you need to be familiar with the common mathematical problems that come up in quantitative reasoning. Just off the top of my head, I can think of distance speed time questions, scheduling questions, area questions and percentage change questions that are all question types that come up very, very often in the quantitative reasoning subtest. Now, what this means is that if you're very familiar with the question types that come up very often on the quantitative reasoning subtest, this means that you won't be shocked or worried on test day because you'll already be familiar with all the questions that could possibly come up. Doing so will mean that you're much, much better at doing quantitative reasoning subtests and also so that you can nail this subtest down. I think that's been enough of me just talking to the camera so let's move on to the third part of this video, which will be me answering some questions live on camera for you guys to see how I attack quantitative reasoning questions. So as usual, I'm sitting in front of my computer and I've pulled up a UCAT quantitative reasoning question bank from the official website. Uh, what I'll be doing is I'll be explaining how I use the calculator and some tips and tricks. And then also I'll be doing a set of four questions live on camera so that you guys can see how my methods, how I'm using my methods and whether they might be more efficient or less efficient than yours and so that you can see the way my brain is working while I'm answering these questions. I'm actually going to skip this first question because it's a standalone and I wanted to show you guys me doing a set of four rather than four standalone questions just because I'm wary of time and I don't want this video to drag out for too long but also because I think it shows and demonstrates the points I made earlier in this video a little bit better as well. So before I actually get into the set of four though I'll show you guys the tips and tricks I have for using the UCAT calculator. So as you can see, I've got the on-screen calculator up on the screen. Uh, the shortcut for using the on-screen calculator is Alt plus C, and you can also move around this little window to wherever you like. So even if it's blocking the information, you can move it so that it's not blocking the information. Now, the first thing I'd like to show you guys that a lot of people don't know about this calculator is that it has a memory function shown by this MRC, M minus and M plus button and what this means is that what you can do is you can put in a number say for example 90 
and then you can add this to the memory by plus pressing M plus. And what this will do is even if I cancel this 90 that's on the screen, and I press C, then what I can do is I can press this MRC button and it will still pull up the 90. So this is actually a very useful thing for things like averages where you might have to add several numbers together or you might have to completely add a lot of numbers together or you might have to minus a number and then get an eventual number which you might have to divide. So this can be very, very useful and it's a function that a lot of people don't actually know about. So I have this thing in memory which is shown by the M on the calculator and now I can also still add things to that 90. So say I wanted to add uh, 30 to that 90, then I could press M plus again, and it will show that it's actually 120 when I now press MRC, which stands for memory recall. Now say I wanted to minus that 30 again, what I can do is I can press the 30, I should type it instead of pressing the buttons, and then I can press that M minus. And now if I memory recall, you'll see that it has 90 again. So this is actually quite a powerful function on this calculator and one that many people don't know about. The unfortunate thing is that I do think you have to press these buttons physically with your mouse, which is the one downside of it. But other than that, it is still a great function for you to use. Now, the final thing I have to say about the memory function is that you can clear the memory by pressing M minus and then M recall. And what that will do is, as you can see, the M disappeared in the top left hand corner. What that means is that the memory has been cleared and then you can add anything you like again into the memory. So as you can see, I think using the calculator can actually be very powerful once you know how to use it. And it definitely helps so much with the quantitative reasoning subtest because there are some questions that you simply can't do in your head. The one tip I have for you getting better at using the calculator is to just do practice with it to get used to using the calculator for calculations so that you get an idea of its limitations and what it can and can't do. So now I'll actually do this set of four questions that's been up on the screen. So as you can see, this is quite classic of a quantitative reasoning question. There's a lot of data on the screen and then just a simple question, which is the percentage of urban women who are obese is. And so what I'll do first in this question is I'll read this data. So I'll read the body mass index is a measure of body fat, blah, blah, blah. It ranges from below blah 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 and then it says someone with a BMI of between 20 to 5 to 30 is defined as overweight and then someone with a BMI of over 30 is defined as obese and that's the important information that I need to know because it tells me that the percentage of urban women who are obese is uh, the BMI is over 30. So looking at this table I see BMI women over 30 to 40 and over 40 and then I see the columns are urban, total, suburban, rural. So I'm just looking at these two numbers here, 17.2 plus 3.2, pretty simple addition. So this is the sort of stuff I'd recommend doing in your head. That's just 20.4, but I could have used the calculator for that, but using it, doing it in your head makes it a lot quicker. So that's a number, for example, that I would also write down. So I have a 20.4 written there. And then what I have to do is I also have to add up all of these numbers to find out the percentage of urban women who exist total and then I can find the percentage who are obese. So what I will do is I'll do, I'll first clear the memory because this might actually be quite useful. Do 2.7, add to memory. Then we got 46.1, add to memory. 30.8, add to memory. 17.2, add to memory. 3.2 add to memory. If I cancel that and I get this memory recall, I get 100. And what this tells us is that it's just 20.4. So now I'll go to the next question, which is that the percentage of rural men who are neither overweight nor obese is. So what this question is asking is for the percentage of rural men who are neither overweight nor obese, which correlates to these two rows on the table. And then I'm looking at the rural column, which is 1 plus 29, 30. So now I have to do the percentage again, but I think that all of these are based on percentages. So regardless of that, I'll add them up just to be safe because I'm not too worried about time in this. I just want to show how I'm thinking. So sometimes you have to click on the calculator before you use a number pad. That's just something you've got to be wary of. 
So I'll do the whole memory recall thing again. I'll just put my mouse over the M plus. I've got one plus 29 plus. And then I've got a hundred again, which tells me that yes, it's just 30. So now the question is the percentage of women who are neither overweight or obese exceeds those who are not by whatever number. Okay. So what I need to find out here is that the percentage of women who are either overweight or obese, and then the percentage of those who are not, and then I need to find the percentage difference. So I've got my calculator here. And now I know I'm just looking at the total column because it's just talking about women, not anyone in any urban area. So now what I'm looking at is essentially using the memory recall function again, which is why it's so useful. 36 point, oops, need to click on the calculator. 32.6, 20.1, 30, 20 and 2.9. I'll do that, I've got that, and I've got 55.6. Then what I can do is I can just cancel on this. And then I can just add these two here, which is dust 44.4. So I can just do this and then minus 44.4, which gives us 11.2, which is C. Now this is the final question we've got. A small English city has a male population of 56,000. Assuming the population of the city is typical of the urban population as a whole, how many men in the city are likely to be obese? So what I'll do is I'll pull up the calculator again, and then I will know that what this question is asking is it's asking me to add together the percentage of men who are obese in urban areas, and then to multiply that by this 56,000 to find the number of men in the city who are likely to be obese. So what I'll do is I'll do 16.4 plus 0 0.7, which is just 17.1. And then what I can do is I can do 17, oops, got to click on the calculator, 17.1 multiplied by 56,000 and then just divide that by 100 in my head it gives us option C. So that's that set of four done. I hope you guys found that helpful. It was a bit weird because it wasn't necessarily specified in this table that all of the at rows added up to 100, which they actually did. And that was kind of confusing me because I didn't see any information about that in the stimulus. So I didn't want to assume, but in that last question, they sort of expected you to assume that. So that's what I did. Uh, before I finish this video, let's quickly skip to the end so that I can check these answers and then show you guys if we got them right. And yep, great to see we got all four correct. I'll see you guys in the conclusion. So that brings me to the end of this video. I hope you found me doing those quantitative reasoning questions really helpful and I also hope that maybe you got some sort of help out of the strategies and tips that I gave to you guys in this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do leave a like, comment or subscribe to the channel as it really does help our channel grow quite a lot. If you have any questions, feel free to comment down below or DM me on Instagram. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching and I wish you guys the best of luck in your quantitative reasoning practice and in your UCAD practice in general.